Hi, this is uh, Nicolas Alexiou, Hellenic American Project, and uh, our special uh, features uh, when we uh, discuss and uh, we have conversations and we present Greek American artists. Today, we are very privileged to have uh, a multi talented person, uh, John Yanis Fotiadis, uh, an architect by training, but also a musician, a painter sketches etc and recently uh, we had uh, this marvelous we still have this marvelous exhibition uh, art exhibition with his uh, works in commemorating also the 200 year anniversary from the greek war of independence uh, the solace of antiquity um, and um, first of all i want to welcome welcome you uh, yanni uh, thank, you, thank you again nico thank you for the invitation it's uh... It's very uh, exciting to and, be part and, of this, and, and be and be part of, of your of your creativity to, to understand uh, uh, what you do and, and how you do that. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to to say the great success and great uh, reception that um, the exhibition um, uh, the Solace of Antiquity uh, has uh, uh, so far. Uh, a lot of responses from uh, Queen's College, from CUNY, and uh, from uh, from people, not only Greeks, but also from people um, uh, from New York and other places who are able to, to see it on uh, our website, hubsource.org. Um, let's talk about this a little bit. Uh, sure. When and how, how you started to, to uh, you know, conceive the, this project and, and uh, and we'll see later how we managed to connect it uh, with the Greek War of Independence. Uh, those are sketches. Uh, those are things that you you, you drew when you visited Greece uh, recently, yeah. right? Yeah. Tell yeah. Well, first of all, first of all, I'm thrilled that the uh, that the exhibit is getting such a positive uh, response and feedback. It's great. It means that it's resonating with people and. Uh, they're getting some value out of it. So that really, really makes me very happy to hear. That's fantastic. And also, the, it's, it's something unusual. I mean, the, 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 the type of, 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 of art you, you have created is very, is not very typical. Uh, it's, it's one thing that you know, people have seen paintings, people have seen uh, uh, sculptures, but, but the, uh, the sketches uh, that you have created are, are, are you know, not not very often, you know, as as a as a form. So I, I would like to, to talk about that. Yeah. Well, well, you know, on that on that particular theme, uh, it's interesting because I, I think you're right. I think in that respect, it's a bit atypical, and I think the reason why is because uh, you know we have largely lived in a period where art has really become an expression of the artist as opposed to any kind of representative art. I think the, the whole advent of modern art really moved uh, the, uh, the theme and the dialogue to the expression of the artist, to, to, for the artist to, to articulate how they were being impacted by what they were seeing, as opposed to trying to represent what they were seeing. And my work, and these drawings, really, uh, they come out of my architectural training because, um, well, first of all, I, I've been drawing since I was a little child. I told you that probably I was drawing before I could speak, and it was always my natural inclination to see something and then try and draw it. Uh, then I didn't know why I was doing that. It just felt like a very natural act to do, but now, I've come to realize that when I try and draw what I see, uh, what that is is an exercise in forcing me to see things that I normally wouldn't see. So I've become a big believer that the, the more you look at something and the closer you look at it and really, really focus and really study it, you begin to see things in that object or subject that, that are not... Um, immediately visible. And I think that's when these objects become a bit more transcendent and become a bit more metaphysical 
And that's really part of what this artwork uh, is trying to convey. It's, it's conveying other things as well, but it has a lot to do with the act of looking and then seeing. Seeing is the, is the key. And also, I think um, it has um, a lot of um, emotions. Uh, I see, I see in, in, in the drawings a lot of emotions. Uh, and also, uh, if you permit me, I would like to share uh, with uh, uh, our audience and the researchers, in, in sure. one of our conversations, you mentioned that as a child, you visited the, the, the Acropolis um, Parthenon with your grandmother. And uh, maybe you, you couldn't understand fully, to, to the full extent, what was going there. It made a great impression into a young child as you were, and, and you carry all this uh, memory uh, and, and, and the nice sentiment with the, the grandmother uh, walking up the holy rock, yeah, seeing yeah. The, that achievement. So I, I, think, I think also, the emotion plays uh, a significant role here. And, and of course, your Greek background, although you are an American born uh, uh, Greek, right? Yes, yes. I, I, speaking to that particular uh, experience, what happened to me is that, and again, this ties back to architecture, but my earliest memory of any, any kind of cognitive idea of architecture was when I was very, very small. I was maybe five or six, maybe a little younger. And my grandmother uh, lived in, uh, in a, near Omonia in Athens. Um, and when you would come out of her house, if you turned a street, you would see a vista going up a hill and there was a, a fragment of the Parthenon. And when I was a very, very young child, I, I happened to turn my head and I saw this fragment up on the hill and the way it was being hit by the light, um, it really had a very uh, profound impact on me because uh, it was at once something extraordinarily beautiful. Um, I could tell without knowing anything about it that it was very, very old. It was old and it was beautiful. And, and as a result, it, it kind of seemed timeless. And that's where these ideas of timelessness and beauty Started to uh, started to enter my mind, and then of course we we went towards it and and we went up and and I've been there you know countless times since. And as when I grew up and was educated and became an architect, then I went back to the Acropolis and the Parthenon, and I understood on on a, on a much more intellectual level the the construct of the whole site. But that early first memory is probably the most vivid. And it's probably one of the most profound images I've ever seen uh, in my life. So absolutely, uh, that emotion uh, is, is absolutely uh, incorporated into these images, for sure. Uh, perhaps we can see some of the images and, and slowly you walk us through. Uh, yeah, let me, yeah, let me see if I can do a screen yeah. share from here. Uh, at the same time, you said that you also do some paintings, right? You also paint? Yes, I do. I, um, I, I have done um, a number of paintings uh, over the course of, uh, of my adult life. By the way, I'm, I'm sharing the screen now. I don't know if you can see it. Excellent. Yes, yes. Yes, yeah, so these are, this is actually a, a copy of the exhibit online. And um, you mentioned a little bit uh, about my, my trips to, my recent trips to Greece. So what I did in 2019, I was in Greece and the, the whole prior year, I was reading uh, Pausanias, I was reading Herodotus, I was reading Plutarch. I was also reading some philosophy, Plato, Aristotle, um, but, primarily interested in the idea of, you know, uh, written histories as kind of a pres preservation of, of another time. I've always been enamored with antiquity, you know, going back to my childhood again because of, of that particular episode regarding the, the Parthenon. But um, 
having uh, studied architecture and uh, learning to draw from the point of view of an architect, the one thing in architecture you realize about drawing is that drawing is really a means to an end. Uh, architects draw in order to convey ideas, in order to design projects, in order to uh, be able to, to uh, place information from one uh, thing to another. What I did in 2019 when I went to Greece after reading uh, all of these uh, authors from antiquity is I started to see drawing also as an end in itself, as a, as a documentation of memory. And so these initial sketches that you see here, which are at the front end of the exhibit, these are actually field sketches out of my sketchbook, particularly from the Roman Agora, you see the um, fragments of the, uh, the gate of Athena Archegitis, of the, the Tower of the Winds, um, which I just did very quickly while I was there in the field, you know, just trying to capture the essence of, uh, of what I was seeing. And what happened is that in the year that followed, with the, uh, with the global pandemic being what it is, and we were all relegated to um, being sequestered in our homes, I went back to these images and, and I decided that I would really flush them out into proper drawings as, as ends in themselves. And that's really what the, what the exhibit constitutes. It's taking these field sketches and observations uh, from Athens, and really uh, creating more refined finished pieces out of them. And this, for example, is the, um, the Arch of Hadrian, which is in the center of the city. Everybody, uh, everybody knows this structure, it's quite famous. Um, so yeah, that was kind of the genesis of this project. And it's a project that's actually continuing. I was in Greece again this past July, I was there for a month. And I did a lot of uh, a lot of field sketching, a lot of uh, documenting with photographs, and I have uh, a whole series of uh, of drawings that I'd like to execute now that now that the summer is coming to a close and we're we're moving into the winter. The process was that you you did the initial sketches there, and then during the pandemic and the lockdown. You do your further development, right here. Exactly, in exactly. I tried to capture yeah. the essence in the drawings, and uh -huh. and I also supplemented them with photographs, multiple photographs, different angles, just to to try and capture how the light mm -hmm. was hitting these objects and why they were um, as iconic and as striking as they were. One of the things that I've talked about in the past. You know, with, with Greece, Greece is, is extraordinary and uh, miraculous in so many ways. But one of the ways that, that is really miraculous, especially to an architect or to somebody who appreciates architecture is the fact that architecture is really defined by light. You know, objects in space are defined by light. And what happens in, the place, in a place like Greece, in the Aegean, during the summer is that the light is so strong and so powerful that even the shadows are luminous. Uh, you, you never see uh, total uh, darkness. You always see some kind of luminosity uh, within the shadow itself. And that almost reveals this, uh, this metaphysical world that, that is beyond uh, what you think you're seeing. Yep. And that's something that really came to me uh, during the lockdown months as I was looking at these images and I was sketching them again and again and again and really kind of considering these forms that, that started to become evident to me as an idea, as an intellectual idea. Excellent. Can you describe some of the uh, elements you use here? Uh, the, the, yeah, the, I, I, the, the technique you use here in the colored. Um, yeah, uh, these the, these two images, both of these images are from the um, Temple of Olympian Zeus in the heart of Athens, and in this case, uh, normally uh, my 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 easiest and kind of my default way to draw is by using graphite on paper, 
Uh, sometimes I use charcoal, but I'm really working primarily in a monochrome uh, context. What I wanted to do here is really start to incorporate color, but in a very, very controlled way. And I, I can't say that I'm such a great painter that I can, I can control color with painting, but these were done with colored pencils. It's a Prismacolor pencils where the colors can be very rich and a, a very broad spectrum of color, but one can still control uh, the color because it's a pencil and because I'm used to drawing with pencils. So what I did here is I based uh, both of these uh, color drawings on black and white drawings that I had done while I was there and then, and then started to add layers of color, Prismacolor to them until I got a level of luminosity that, that I felt was not so much representing what I saw but representing kind of the metaphysical aspect of these sites. And they are really uh, very compelling that way. In, uh, in one of the comments that I received from yes. people who saw uh, the exhibit, they said that uh, they asked me if this is a photograph. <laughs> so I think, I, I, I think you manage uh, the, the coloring you know, in the, very, the best way possible. Because they thought it was um, just a picture, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 uh, I, I appreciate that. The funny thing is that if you actually were to see a photo, it, you know, this I, I would hope that these have a bit more of an ethereal quality to them. While they look photorealistic, there's no doubt about it. There's also kind of a little bit of a, a twist in terms of the light and the tone that that gives them what I would hope is kind of a sense of hyper reality. That's, that's what I was going for uh, with these images. Again, it's all, it, it was all an intellectual exploration. I, was, I tell people that I was thinking as much as I was drawing throughout this whole project. There was a lot of thinking and staring going on as well as drawing. So, um, let's scroll up to here. You can Here's see the, you, you can see the, the project uh, from the beginning or while you are drawing, you said, I'm going to make this set of, of, of sketches. Uh, or, it really, or, it, it was something, it was something that came into focus after my trip. While okay. I was there, while I was there I, in 2019, I just tried to document as much as I could. I just tried to find um, mm -hmm. images, from antiquity that I thought were iconic and compelling and ask myself, why do these images affect me the way they do? And that's as far as it went. It wasn't until I came back and I looked at everything that I had drawn, I realized that, you know, there's some kind of a narrative in all of this. And if I, if I edit these images and, and choose to develop certain images in full form, I can, I can actually <clears throat> create a narrative that could be quite compelling. And that's, yes, what, the, that's what happened. Yes, yes, yeah, I agree, because uh, uh, when, you, when you sold me the, the sketches, I, I realized that this is, this is what uh, I understood, that there is a narrative yeah. there. Absolutely. Exactly. Uh, it is interesting I mean, this... how, how art works, right? How you, know, you do things uh, not fully in, in full consciousness in the beginning. And then no, not at all. Not it's it's, al it's uh -huh. almost as if a uh, there's something that's kind of working uh, through you to to convey something, and it's it's only you realize it almost after the fact. Uh, this is one of my most favorite. I, I I favored all of them, but this is one of my you know. I'm gonna see if I can bring more it favorite. Because yeah, this is it's this very is one of my. My favorites as well. Yeah. Yeah. The 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 conscious and the unconscious. The the the, the human, you know, walk up and yeah. and, 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 and and the gods of Olympus above. You know, it's a. Um, you know, you know, uh, uh, Nico. What's very interesting about the Propylaea? I went back to the Acropolis. Actually, I was there twice this summer, and. 
you know, everybody focuses on the Parthenon and everybody focuses on the Erechtheum, but the Propylaea is, is one of the most compelling structures I've ever been in because it's a gateway. And it's such a powerful gateway, the way it's situated and the way it's sited, even, even in its decayed form, which this drawing is capturing, you really feel that it's the separator between two realms, you know, the realm of man, the realm of mortals, and then the, the temenos, you know, the holy precinct beyond, which is really the realm of the gods. And I thought that this particular image uh, was, uh, was interesting because if you notice about 75% of the image is just the sky. <laughs> the building really constitutes, you know, like the lower quarter of the image, but in a way that's really also successful architecture where uh, you, you build something which underscores an idea. And in this case, it's an idea of transition from one place to another. Um, that's what's being conveyed here. And I'm yeah, it's, it's, it's one of my favorites as well. I'm, I'm very glad you mentioned that. Uh, also, uh, another comment that came many times in different ways, but the same meaning. Um, and I'm glad that we decided to have this uh, exhibit uh, during the lockdown because it, it gave people this sense of openness, this, yeah. this, this sense of, 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 of freedom. You know, yeah. so it was... a. Uh, uh, I think at the right time. I mean, it's always the right time for art, but during the lockdown, these uh, these uh, images they gave people a lot of a lot of hope and and, and strength. And uh, I'm very pleased well, for that. I'm, I'm thrilled to hear that. You know, the we are we are uh, creatures that need to be out in the open. You know, and I think. Again, Greece is so miraculous on so many levels, but in terms of the, the way space was perceived and handled in antiquity, particularly in a place like the Acropolis of Athens, you know, you really, you get to the summit of this mountain, this hill in the center of the city, and you have, you feel as if you're in the center of the world. Uh, and yet the buildings there, um, ground you and anchor you in, in such a way that you, you really feel a, a, a degree of fulfillment, which is rather extraordinary. You know, it's really, it's really extraordinary. And I think uh, this is one of the uh, you know, lessons that uh, antiquity and its uh, solas can uh, teach us now, and I think you as an architect can uh, enlighten us more on that, is a new generation of uh, architects and also uh, uh, slowly more politicians realize uh, the concept of open space in the cities, modern cities, and, and, and the importance of, um, of public spaces. Right? Because yes. the, the person on the Acropolis was a public space. It, it wasn't for you know, to commemorate, uh, you know, one leader and only, that, that was an open space. So uh, is, is, is uh, some kind of movement in, uh, in, in the new architecture, in the structure and design of cities I think, now? Well, I think uh, there, there are a lot of different initiatives in terms of the design of cities presently. Obviously, you know, the idea of, um, of green cities and cities that are more ecologically uh, sensitive. But I think a lesson uh, from antiquity that can still be learned, which is one that I'm learning, uh, really one that I've only become aware of in the last few years that I've actually started these drawings on uh, and approached them from a very serious level by going to these sites, is that in antiquity, I really believe that um, human beings were much more in tune with their natural environments. And the reason I say that is because these ancient uh, temple precincts always were oriented towards mountains, towards hills, 
uh, towards geographic features that to the, the ancient Greeks were the embodiments of the deity that the uh, temple precincts were commemorating. And so even, even if you don't understand that on an intellectual level, when you go to the, a site like the Acropolis, or when you go to the Temple of Poseidon at Cape Sunion, you can't help but feel compelled that somehow the site is really grounded in its surroundings. It's open, it, it, it's, it's part of the cosmos, and it's also bringing the cosmos into a scale and a level of understanding that can be comprehended by the human mind. That, that to me is the biggest lesson that I've taken from, from visiting these sites and drawing them and trying to analyze and also understand why, why is this making me feel the way that I do? So that is a very architectural exercise and it's something that I think uh, is also evident in these images. Yeah. The harmony, the harmony yeah. between. Yeah. There's always, a, there's a balance. There's a balance, and nature, nature is always visible. I mean, even if you, if you see this color drawing, this is the Thesion, you know, the temple of Hephaestus. Mm -hmm. This is the, uh, the north uh, colonnade. When you look through that colonnade, you can see a Mount Imitos way, way in the distance. It's the same mountain that you see from the Parthenon. And again, the orientation is such that the mountain becomes part of the composition and it's part of the Temenos, it's part of the precinct, which is yeah. really, really interesting to me. And uh, it's very interesting that um, the Temple of Hephaestus, because it was a god of creating, uh, making uh, tools. Correct. So you see you see the working class aspect here, you know, and human beings surviving because we invent tools, because we create also. You see also the creativity, uh, of human, the human creativity to, to, to make life, you know, to make uh, you know, the, the, the means to, to, to survive. So I think this is a, so there's, extreme... a there's a lot of there's a lot of inherent beauty and, a, and a, a really a, a memorialization of the human condition in these buildings. And mm -hmm. I have to say that even though I'm a, I'm a modern architect, I live in the modern era, I've designed modern buildings, I have yet to see modern structures that, that have the same kind of poetic impact and that reflect the human condition the way these buildings do. I, I've, I haven't come across any yet. And that, <laughs> That includes buildings that I've designed, by the way. So okay. I find myself going back and drawing these again and again and again and again, just trying to understand what is it, what, what, what is it about the poetic of these, uh, of these structures that, that so closely connect to the human condition? And again, uh, uh, what you said before about the variations of light, uh, there yeah. are more objects here. It is, uh, it is a, a great, uh, you know, depiction of yeah. what you do. You know, and, and this is interesting. This is, this is the, um, the Western uh, porch where the um, op, um, Opistodomos would be, which is kind of a false entrance to the temple. And even in its decayed state, you know, it, it kind of transforms into another another type of building because now you see light streaming through where there used to be a roof over this portico. But the buildings are, are so um, plastic and sculptural in their quality and the way they were created because really they were personifications and embodiments of gods. Let's not forget that. They have a real anthropomorphic quality that even today, even in their decayed state, there's something very organic about them. They don't feel mechanical. And that's really what this image was, uh, was what I was thinking when I was drawing this image, the, the kind of organic quality of these buildings. Very interesting, yes. Let me, uh, we, can, we can push through. This was just uh, a funny, uh, a funny episode because as I was walking through the 
the Agora and I went into the Stoa of Attalus. I happened to be thinking of Herodotus because I had read Herodotus the whole winter before. And I happened to turn around and who do I see but Herodotus in front of me, uh, a, a bust or really a herm of Herodotus. So I felt so compelled because we she were literally staring at each other at yeah. eye level. I she felt started, that, she, she started following you. <laughs> yeah, I felt like history was staring right, right into my eyes as I was staring into his eyes. So I, it, it was a, a compulsion I had. I felt I had to, to draw and kind of memorialize that moment. So yeah, and, and it is a, and a very important, uh, uh, you know, statement that uh, uh, we in our modern version we have to to know history. We have to know. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And all the movements uh, that we see in the past and now, it is to, you know, restructure, to, to put history, you know, more into the front and, and make us understand uh, our times by, by understanding uh, the past, I think. Right? The, I, the past. I totally agree. Yeah. As, uh, as uh, this American uh, uh, author says, Faulkner, that the past is never past, it's not even past, right? It's always there. So it's something, history is not something that, you know, has passed and, and forgotten, but rather how we make sense of all this. Now, I, yeah. I, I agree. Yeah. And I think, I think citing Herodotus is interesting also in yeah, the fact yeah. that very, very interesting, yeah. He, he was actually one of the first documentarians of past events to really look at history as a living, breathing thing, mm -hmm. rather than, than just a laundry list of, of events that occurred. Uh, I, I, you know, it's funny, I was, I was looking at Herodotus just last night. Uh, I was looking specifically at a reference to uh, Egypt. And if you know the histories of Herodotus, you know that He's um, he's talking about one thing, but suddenly he'll go off on a tangent and begin a whole other conversation. And he goes into depth about Egypt. And uh, I just uh, I was laughing to myself that here I am two and a half thousand years later and I'm still using him as a reference for something that I was curious about. It was a, about a temple complex in Memphis that I happened to be reading about and I opened my Herodotus to, to see what he says about it. These are, these are two interesting images. Uh, this is the, um, the impact of Rome on Greece and, uh, or, or vice versa, I should say. The, the upper right is, uh, an oversized head of the Emperor Hadrian, who we all know was the great uh, Phil Hellene Emperor mm -hmm. and who, who had a, a massive in, uh, impact on Athens in antiquity by uh, actually finishing the Temple of Olympian Zeus that we were looking at a little bit earlier and uh, building a library and even uh, an aqueduct. Uh, you could tell he, he had a sincere love for all things Greek and uh, and the oh. city of Athens, and, and since we and since we mentioned the Her Herodotus, uh, the, if we go back, the, the we see we can see in in his uh, texts that the word Philhellene uh, exists there, describing uh, an, an Egyptian right. uh, uh, you know, uh, pharaoh. Um, so it's not it's not a, a new word. It is a word that goes back uh, centuries to, to antiquity. The word Philippines. Yeah, uh, absolutely, absolutely. I uh, if there's one image in this collection that that I think really spoke to me. Uh, yes, it's, it's this one, and the reason I um, the reason I cite this image specifically is because. It was during the drawing of this image that I began to understand what was happening uh, as far as my, my thought process and, 
my my uh, view and perception of um, of these objects from antiquity and why they were having such a profound effect on me. And it became really evident here. This is an anth anthemion, which is really the top of uh, a grave steel that had broken off. And it's in the Roman Agora, this fragment. As a matter of fact, this past summer, I found it again. It's still leaning against the same wall, still sitting on the same stick. That's one of the wonderful things about places like Athens. You can leave and go back two years later and you'll find things uh, exactly as you left them. But more, more importantly, you have this, this um, memorial of, um, of this organic form, uh, beautifully rendered in stone, uh, sitting there, uh, timeless, uh, and next to it, a live ivy plant, uh, <laughs> which is casting a shadow on this stone. And so between the stone and the ivy, you get this third uh, element of the shadow, which, which is, um, you know, uh, transient. It, it, it's constantly changing and constantly moving. And I found it, it was so beautiful, these ideas, these juxtaposed ideas of life uh, and, and non-life of organic and inert things, of, of things that were... Um, uh, ephemeral and, and timeless, all meeting and all kind of coexisting in this cosmos, that's when I began to realize, you know, I think I'm getting a little bit closer to the, the, the poetry that, that I'm seeing, and I'm beginning to understand why it's having such a profound uh, impact on me. So I, this is probably my favorite of all of the images um, in, this, in this exhibit. And the letters, right? That it's fantastic. Yeah. The, the logos, the, the written word, also. Yes, yes. It's uh, it's the, Timotheus, son of Timostratus. That's what yeah. I've come to understand. Uh, yeah. That inscription, yeah. which is all grave stealers. They they mentioned the person buried there, and then they would mention who he was the son or daughter of, which was yeah. which was uh, standard. And, and, also, yeah. and also, we realize this unique thing of the Greek language, the continuity, the unbroken link. Absolutely. I mean, isn't it miraculous that you and I yeah. yes, can look yes. at this and we can read it without any, without any issue at all? Yeah, without, uh, without Google translation, you can read it, yes. Right, right, exactly. I'm going to just move to this, move to the, some more images here. Again, the Roman Agora, the, the, the Tower of the Winds. This is actually charcoal on gray tone paper. Um, I love this building because it's, uh, it's this small quirky building that was built in, you know, during the Roman period, uh, some scholars refer to it as the world's first weather station. It's really a, uh, a monument to the, the wind directions. Each also, face. Also for time. Yes, that's right. That's right. In other words, there was, a, there was a water mechanism, a clock mechanism within the tower yes. that was driven by a, um, uh, a water that was stored in a reservoir directly adjacent to the tower. So this is kind of a, a mechanical device uh, as well, which which tells you a little bit about the the level of uh, of engineering in that period. But uh, what I found particularly uh, compelling here is that each wind direction is personified, you know, in this anthropomorphic form. And this is, I believe, uh, Kaiskias, which is the northeast wind, and he's rendered as an old man with a shield full of hailstones, <laughs> believe it or not, <laughs> which, uh, which I thought was just amazing. So I, I was so taken by that, that I, I just felt compelled to draw it. As a matter of fact, this is one of the field sketches. Uh, this is the final drawing based on one of the field sketches that I showed at the beginning of our, of our discussion. And then as we move on, you know, the, the, the last few images are, are studies at the Temple of Poseidon. 
uh, field sketches as well as more finished drawings down in Cape Sunium. Yeah, another favorite of mine. Yeah, I mean, I can't, I can't say enough about this, this place. For those who have not been to Sunion, you're, you're depriving yourself because if you've ever wanted to see a, uh, a fusion of, of man and nature and, and the articulation of that relationship through architecture, this is the place to see it. Uh, it's just extraordinary. Every time I go, and I must have been there now maybe 30 or 40 times over the course of my life, it's as if I'm going for the first time. That's very interesting, yeah. Let me, uh, let, because let me stop. Every, because every time you, you discover something new, something else, right? Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's Well, you know, the other thing, Nico, is that if you go during the day, it's a different place. If you go at sundown when most of the tourists go, it's a different place. If you go at night, it's a different place. So even though it's the same place, yeah. it has this uh, transcendent quality of, of changing over the course of the day and over the course of the seasons, which, which is really, really extraordinary. I'm going to stop this now and um, get back to our, to our sharing. Here, there we go. <laughs> Thank you. Can you Thank see you. me now? Am I back? Yes, thank you for sharing uh, this. Uh, and, and of course, this is this is the exhibit that's online uh, at uh, the Hellenic American Project, and it's there, and people can go and take a look at it. And yeah, and, you in, know, in in the gallery, hapsos.org, and then gallery, yeah. and uh, you are there. And uh, if people want to say any comments, we are you know welcoming. Absolutely, uh, it, it's very interesting. So. Uh, there, there are some sketches that uh, took more time than others. Time is first concerned how long it took to, to, to finish one. Although in art, I don't know if anything Noth ends. Nothing is ever finished. <laughs> or, or, or finished, right. But, but <laughs> coming closer, yeah, by approximation. Yeah, exactly. It, you know, it, it all depended. Sometimes you work on something and you say, well, this is not quite complete. Um, every piece is different and every piece uh, hits you in a different way. There are some drawings in that collection. It took me maybe a week or two to complete. There are others that took me three weeks. I mean, the Anthemion, once I started really looking at it and really drawing it, and there's a lot of detail in that um, image. And I, I didn't do it just for the sake of being able to show my drawing gymnastics, but it was a piece where the, the detail is particularly important because it's an organic plant form that's echoed in a living plant that's adjacent to it. So I felt it was very important to, to show both of those with an equal, uh, equal point of view. And so that drawing uh, took a little bit longer. I mean, you have uh, a professional training on one hand, but uh, as far as concerned art, people think that it is you know, an open-ended situation, but does it require some kind of discipline also? Absolutely. Uh, you, you have to know um, when you're gonna get tired and, and um, when you're gonna get sloppy and you have to know to stop and come back. And there's another uh, discipline uh, that's required, which I, I will be the first to admit, sometimes I'm less successful at maintaining, and that is the original objective of your piece. You know, when you begin, when you embark on a, on a work of art like that, you have a vision in mind, you have a narrative in mind, and sometimes the drawing gets ahead of you uh, to the point where you, you almost lose focus as to, and sometimes you need to to pull yourself back, at least I do, in order to maintain the original concept. Uh, other artists, they let that drive the process. They let this kind of sense of improvisation and emotion drive the process. But for, for these particular images and for this particular project, that wasn't what I was looking for. I needed to drive uh, the process here. Very interesting. And then, um... 
you said that that gave you uh, an additional inspiration or, or, or will to go back and continue um, yes. the sketch of other sites or similar sites. Right? So soon, uh, soon going to have a, a new a new set of, of, of uh, sketches for another yeah. example. Probably. Absolutely. I'm already working on them. But while I was in Greece, I was posting a lot of images to my Instagram and people were tracking. Um, and, you know, I spoke a, a few moments ago about the relationship with nature that a lot of these ancient sites have. And so I started, I, I was rereading a book that I had read while I was in architecture school called The, uh, the, the Earth, the Temple and the Gods by Vincent Scully, who was a famous art historian at Yale University. He wrote this book in the 1960s. And he was the first one who really was able to decode the, the way Greek religious buildings, I mean, not churches, I'm talking temples, uh, were situated on their sites and in the landscape and how they were oriented. And there was a very, very uh, intimate and close relationship with natural features, geographic features. So reading that book, when I went back to Greece in July, I made it a point to go to, to revisit places like Delphi, but I also went to Brauron, Vravrona, the, the temple of uh, Artemis there. There were a number of other smaller temples uh, that I wanted to see that are kind of off the beaten path of the typical tourist routes, but they really were other beautiful examples of, again, of, of this relationship of nature to the built form. And that is something that really impacted uh, my, my thinking recently. I think uh, anybody who is an architect can really benefit from looking at that. I realize we live in a totally different age, largely driven by technology and, and machines. But I think that remembering uh, our place in nature and, and memorializing our relationship with nature uh, will only lead to positive things. And that's something that uh, Greek temple precincts of antiquity did extraordinarily well. Uh, and this was an idea that was lost by the time the Romans started building, it was already an idea that was put on the back burner. It was, it's really a Greek idea. And it's really a, an idea of the high classical period in Greece. Uh, and you can see it wherever you go, whether you go to Olympia, whether you go to Delphi, the, the Parthenon, of course, the, the Poseidon at Sunion, a lot of other sites um, uh, reflect exactly the, the same concept, which I, which I think is a fascinating idea. Interesting. Uh, now, if you permit me to ask another question, not exactly related to the sure. art, but to the politics uh, of antiquity, since you have traveled wide and vast um, and you know Italy very well. Do the, yes. Greek, do the Greek governments or the ministries take care, a good care of our antiquities if you compare it with Italy, for example? The, the answer is no. <laughs> um, I'll give you an example. Uh, you, this is a site that you probably know very well, Thorikos which is just outside of uh, Lavrium, near Sunium. It's an, actually an ancient Mycenaean settlement. Uh, one of the reasons it's so compelling is because there's this hill. It's called Velaturi Hill, which is almost a perfect cone. And it's, it, speaks about, it speaks to this idea of orienting buildings to this natural feature. Um, I went to Thorikos, drove right up, got out of my car and just started walking around. There was one old chain link fence, which has been knocked down. So if I wanted to, I could have literally gone inside some of these Mycenaean tombs that are at the top of the hill. Uh, now, I would have been, had I done that, I would have been very careful and very sensitive, but not everybody is like me. So the fact that the, the site is completely accessible and completely open 
and totally unmonitored was very uh, distressing to see. And that is only a, one of many, many uh, archaeological sites uh, through Greece. Now, on the one hand, you know, the Greek government has a problem because there are so many of these sites that it's almost impossible to, to keep track of all of them. Having said that, I think that these are uh, artifacts that belong to all of humanity and uh, they need to be taken care of. They need to be uh, attended to. Yes, uh, it's a sad story because I have similar experiences and I remember uh, after spending the whole day uh, in a, a prehistoric site near Volos, my hometown, Wow. At some point, there was a, a guard there that appeared late. And I told him, look, if I wanted to take this stone from the Minoan era or whatever, you know, hey, go home, I can do that. So, yeah. Hey. And then he, he was surprised and said, who wants to take this old rock from here? <laughs> well, you know, yeah. I had, you know, we were, we were talking earlier in the summer about the, uh, Elefsis. I went to Elefsis as well, yeah. and I spent a whole day on that archaeological site, and that's all. That's almost a whole other conversation. Oh yes, of course. But it was basically myself and and a woman with a whistle and a straw hat sitting under a tree on the whole site. And I, I understand, you know, resources are very very tight, and um, uh, you know it's impossible to keep track of everything. But we're talking about a site that has so much weight and gravity and it's so important on so many different levels the fact that luckily there was a gate there and you know it's fenced in but nevertheless you would you would expect it to have a bit more infrastructure uh looking after it you know? especially now since lfc's has been uh, selected to be yeah. the cultural capital of europe and uh, yeah so yeah and this is, is a very special case and maybe we need another discussion on that. We do. Uh, I, know, I know you're intimately uh, familiar with it. And I, in fact, I would really like for us to go together sometime. Yes, I think actually. I can get something, uh, something of real value out of that. But I did, I did a lot of sketches at Ellipsis, a lot of sketches. And that's going to be coming uh, as a series of drawings as well. I think you and I are going to be working Excellent. on that project together. Yeah. Yes, I, I, I like that very much. Yeah. Now, uh, uh, you mentioned about painting, uh, uh, that you also paint. Uh, what kind of material you use? It's, uh, it's uh, uh, oil, it is, uh, it is uh, you know, aquarellas. What kind of paintings do you use? I've used primarily oil painting. I think, as a matter of fact, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a painting over there yes. on the wall. That is, uh -huh. uh, that is a piece that I did years ago. But yeah, it's oil painting, and um, it, I would say that painting for sure was an offshoot of architecture for me. So usually what I paint uh, have been architectural forms in space. Um, and yeah, I've, uh, oil, oil paint uh, gives a, a certain quality, uh, a, a spatial quality uh, to paintings. But, you know, it's a, uh, it's a difficult medium to master, you know. Um, I haven't done a lot of painting recently. I found that drawing for me, it just gets me to the place I want to go much faster. So that's why I've been focused on it more lately. It is important for a painter to know how to draw? I think so. I, I think that one is, um, while people can argue that they are two different mediums, they are, but I also think that one can learn from drawing and really push it into painting. And I think because primarily painting, uh, if you look at traditional painting, traditional drawing, I think painting opens up a world of color that traditional monochrome drawing cannot. And my, my prisma color drawings were try, trying to kind of bridge between those two things you know, to va varying degrees of success, I would say. But, um, but yeah, yeah, it's all about color in painting.
And, uh, oh, yeah. and, and where is the moment where the music comes uh, into your creativity? <laughs> I remember one uh, MK event yeah. with, uh, with the Harlem uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce when it was a combination, a co presentation between uh, the Greek, the Betica song, yes. and, and, and the blues. Blues. And, yeah. and, all, and all of a sudden, you, you you got up, you got your guitar, and you start playing some blues with uh, with a group from from uh, Harlem. And uh, yeah, it was the first time I realized that uh, you you are a musician. Also, and then I I, I you know I, I became more familiar with your other works. So tell us about about uh, music. It was uh, early in in your life. I understand that you are you are pretty close uh, with. Uh, in your neighborhood in New Jersey with uh, Bruce Springsteen, I understand that, and other <laughs> musicians. So all of that had an influence in you, I guess. Tell well, us about the music. Actually, you know, it, we, we were talking before about the Greek American experience growing up right here in, uh, in northern New Jersey. And, and part of that experience was I grew up in a time uh, that. Uh, rock and roll and uh, and that kind of music was extremely popular it was really the popular music of the period i don't think you can make that argument today i think i think it's way too niche oriented and you've got a lot of different people doing a lot of different styles but in terms of the popular culture at the time and i'm talking really the 1970s is when i grew up uh, rock music was really kind of the the, the pop music of the period and I really got into it as a result of being involved with the, the kids in my neighborhood who had older siblings who were playing. And it was almost like a rite of passage that you, if you hung around with musicians or musical kids long enough, you would eventually pick something up and, um, you know, and it's fairly easy music to learn. So it's one of these things where anybody can do it almost, you know, and that's why it became so popular. So that was the, um, the roots of it. But like everything else that I do, <laughs> you know, I like to go very, very deep. And uh, I, I started taking lessons when I was a, a kid, actually on drums, believe it or not. And uh, from drums, uh, I graduated to guitar, to bass, to keyboards, and Throughout high school and college, you know, I became one of these guys that was always running a musical life as a parallel. And I, for me, for me personally, it's been just one one more mode of art and expression uh, that has its own rules. It has its own parameters. It has its own uh, results. But it's a great thing to go to when I get stuck either as an architect or as an artist, uh, what I can't resolve creatively in those things, I seem to be able to resolve musically. And what I've noticed is that all of these different artistic uh, ideas and, and modes of expression, they tend to reinforce each other. So I think uh, the musical brain is the same as the artistic brain. It's the same as the the architectural brain. They're all they're all part of the same uh, general uh, area, and I do it you quite see, seriously. Yeah, you, you see connection between drawing, painting, and music. You, you see Absolutely. Connection. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they, they, there are connections between, again, the way I choose to go about it is, mm -hmm. is very much with the mindset of an architect in that, in my mind, everything has a structure, an underlying structure. It could be a painting, it could be a piece of music, it could be a drawing. And when you learn to put a structure together and you have a skeleton, you have a framework, then you can begin to add and to build on that in such a way as to make it do what you want it to do. And uh, in that respect- there's a lot of, uh, I see what you mean. You mean there's a lot, of, a lot of mathematics in architecture and music, right? And ratios and, and, and 
some divisions, yes, I realize. There are, yeah. there are. There, there, well, actually, what you're talking about also is proportion. Uh, yeah. And, and yeah, there are ratios. And, uh, you know, this is what uh, makes Pythagoras so important, both to musicians and architects and philosophers, right? Because all of this stuff is related. It's, and it's about a bigger, really what I think is, is the, a, a perception of beauty in the brain. You know, we, we like harmony, har harmonious things. We like uh, balance, we like proportion. We, we like to see beauty uh, embodied in, in those ways. And, and for me, there, there are things that I can do musically that I could never be able to do in, in art or in architecture and vice versa. So I feel very lucky that I'm able to uh, write and record music. And I have a, a small music studio here in my home. And I've done uh, all different kinds of music. I mean, primarily in, a, in the, the realm of the music I grew up with, which is kind of rock and blues rock. But I've also done instrumental pieces for um, uh, theatrical productions. I've done some uh, pieces for podcasts. I've done some uh, things for... Um, for TV, so it's just been one more uh, mode mode of uh, creativity for me. And in some cases, you also wrote the lyrics. Yes, yes. In the in the original music that I've written and released on my own, uh, in some cases, it's all me: lyrics, music, arrangement, performance, engineering. Give us an idea about <coughs> how, how how many songs or or, or albums have you? produce so far on on my own uh, first of all my my name my musical name that i perform under it's called empty city squares which is really an homage to uh giorgio de curico uh, but that's the that's kind of my performing name and under empty city squares i've released three albums of original music the most recent one was released this past june it's called The Disappearing Architect, and you can find it on Bandcamp, and you can read the liner notes and, and, uh, and figure out what that's all about. With your permission, uh, we'll have the link into our website. We'll please, have yeah, please do. And, I, and, and that's a, a project where I enlisted the help of a number of friends, uh, musicians, who helped me with different pieces. But I wrote it, and I arranged it, but I had a few guest performers on it. And uh, I'm very proud of it. I think it's a very, uh, it's a very solid uh, piece of work as an album. You know, again, I tend to think of things as holistic products, you know, the way I would think of a drawing or the way I would think of a series of drawings as an exhibit. This album is really like an exhibit of songs. You know, that's kind of, that's kind of how I look at it. So yes, that's the other, that's the other big uh, component of, uh, of who I am, for sure. Were your, uh, your parents uh, fond of your creativity? Not at all. <laughs> drawing? They were, if anything, they were very distressed. <laughs> they, they wanted you to play more Greek music, maybe? No, I think they wanted me to be a doctor. <laughs> I, think, I think that's where the, the want uh, stopped there. Uh, I think I think you know you know there's a natural fear of uh, of people uh, when when you have a kid and it shows an interest in a creative endeavor because again thinking very practically they were wondering how I would make a living if I if I pursued these creative uh, pursuits. Well, my answer to that now, uh, you know, uh, forty plus years later, is that. Uh, if you do what you love, you'll figure out a way to make a living. What you shouldn't do is what you don't like, because then you'll never make a living doing it, you know? So, uh, you know, I, uh, I, I have no delusions about my music. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a professional musician. Uh, that's not how I make my money. But I like to think of myself as a fairly serious uh, composer uh, and, and an artist who puts out music for consumption. And uh, the people that have heard it and listened to it and pay attention to it, they see that like my 
drawings and like my architecture, there's an intellectual depth that it has. And that's always been uh, my goal, you know, with, with any creative activity that I embark on, I, I want it to have a, a substantive uh, meaning, you know, uh, there's got to be some, some meat on the bone, some substance there. And I think my music has that. Yeah. Uh, recently, unfortunately, I had a big loss as far as concern. Uh, yeah. Uh, this earth, Miki Sodorakis, of course, he will never die he, because he, he, he will live forever through his music and the love of people, not only from Greece. The loss was uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a larger scale, not, not only sure. for, for, for Greece. So you, you were familiar with, uh, with his music? And, of course. Uh, I mean, I mean what, I, what I found fascinating about Theodorakis and, and to his credit is that in many ways he was all things to all people. You know, he... He created music that was very deep and very personal and had a lot of, you know, very deep emotional meaning, particularly in terms of the struggles that Greece as a nation had gone through. But on the other hand, he also created music that was fairly palpable and commercial uh, that also show, uh, shined a light on Greece in a way that it couldn't have had a light shined on it in any other way. I mean, if I think of like the the soundtrack to Zorba the Greek, you know, in a way that became more the Greek national anthem in the 1960s and 70s than anything else. You know, the single brand identifier of that country. And of course, you know, that he was a very, uh, you know, just a giant figure. I mean, what do you, what do you say about somebody like that? This is like a Picasso. This is, this is somebody who is so big as a figure, he, he kind of transcends his ethnicity and his place of origin, he really becomes a world figure, you know. And uh, and yeah, yeah, it was a it was a big loss. Uh, but he he also seems to have lived a very very full and a very long life. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The way we produce and the way we consume music um, has changed dramatically. I think. Uh, I know for myself and other people, uh, for, for me and other people, a particular song or a particular group in the 70s or 80s was significant, very important change in our lives, way of thinking, behavior, right. etc. Has music still has this, 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 this impact to the people or even how you create music now through computer programs, etc.? Is, is it the same or is, is, is something different that we cannot follow? Uh, wow, that's it's a fascinating uh, question. I think that, you know, depending on which historical period you look at, you see, you look at certain artistic movements that move the culture, right? And when you think of the 1960s, for example, worldwide, not just in the United States, but there was a moment where popular music, it really moved beyond popular music and it became an art form that was also a massive, massive cultural mover. Uh, you know, my heroes, for example, the Beatles, they defined that era in the music that they put out, but there was a point that they hit where they were no longer pop stars or, or even musicians. They really were these, these cultural figures that were moving the culture. And it was through music that they were moving it. Today, uh, I don't think uh, music or popular music is moving the culture in that way, partially because I think we have multiple cultures that we're dealing with simultaneously. Uh, I know, for example, the way music is consumed uh, is no longer uh, in a way that it was consumed 40 years ago. When you would go to a store, you would buy an album, you would bring it home, and you would listen to it from one end to the other like a finished work of art. Today, you put on Spotify or Apple Music and you just ask whatever song you want to hear, and then the algorithm will send you other songs you've never heard of that it thinks you're going to like. So the idea of the album as a work of art is finished. Uh, 
um, you know, you're never going to see the dark side of the moon again uh, because there's just no, it, it's not part of the cultural context. It, it is as an artifact, but it's no longer uh, a, a part of the living culture. I don't know what is, to be honest with you. I think now we're, now we're moving more into a sociological realm of which you're an expert. But I think that we're still in this postmodern era where things are being cut and pasted from all different uh, historical sources, from all different cultural sources, and they're being rejigged and reassembled and consumed in different ways. But I don't think there's one specific um, artistic movement, whether it's in music or anything else, that's really driving uh, the zeitgeist right now. You know, I, I just don't see it. Uh, maybe I'm a little out of touch. Maybe, maybe I'm just unaware. But, you know, everything is on demand. I mean, that's a great way of putting it. You don't, you don't sit there and wait for the big television special. You just go and choose what you want to watch when you want to watch it. Same thing with, with uh, music, the same thing with film, with, with still images, you know, drawings, paintings, artwork, whatever the case may be. So it's really a, uh, an on-demand uh, aesthetic culture that we live in. And as a result, I don't really see any artistic drivers uh, pushing that in any way. I mean, in architecture, I, I can say the same thing. There are a lot of different um, styles, styles is not a good word. There are a lot of different movements of architecture right now that are, are addressing different issues, a lot of them valid, but I can't say that there's one uniform school of thinking that's driving architectural thought today. And I think part of the reason why is because we just live in an age where everything is on demand. I don't know if, if what I'm saying makes sense but um, maybe, it, maybe it, it, it makes sense and i think that would be a nice conclusion to answer to, to this question because we both live uh you know uh, part of the 20th century now part of the 21st century and if we see art as as, as, a, as a totality as a whole all serious art uh, uh, created uh, during the 20th century was a response to social, political, economic issues. Right. So it, 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 and art plays a significant role to all of this. Now, uh, moving towards, uh, moving on on the 21st century, has art can play that role again? This this political statement. This, this, what is art for you now? This is this is the. the the question I would like to, to discuss. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, for the world, I think art is probably largely driven by technology, at least from what I can see. For me personally, uh, the older I become, the, the more complicated and confusing a world I seem to inhabit. And as a result, I find myself going more internal rather than external. So I think the art that I'm creating is really more of an um, internal examination, trying, trying to make sense of, uh, of where I am and who I am within a, within a framework and context that I can at least understand. You know, um, in order to read a book, you have to understand the language that it's written in first. And so um, what I'm doing is I'm working within languages that I, at least I know how to read so that I can articulate the uh, ideas in, in, in a more uh, clear way. Uh, what I find is that every day uh, that I turn on my computer or I look at the outside world via the internet, I mean, I look at, for example, digital art right now, how it's being created, how it's being distributed, how it's being sold, uh, how it's being consumed. I mean, things are happening at such, such rapid fire speed. It's, it's almost impossible to, to keep up and comprehend. You know, you, you think you understand one model only to find that the next day, the model has completely changed. The paradigm has shifted again. 
So I don't know if this is the new normal, that it's just a constant state of change, uh, a constant state of flux. Uh, for me personally, uh, I, I can't keep up with that. You know, I have to kind of latch on to things that I understand and then do maybe narrower but deeper explorations uh, in those things. Yeah, but art remains still, right, uh, a great source of not only enjoyment, but also a response, you think? Either it is individual or more collective, it depends, right? I, I, I think it does. I think it does because I think in the end, you know, art has been around much, much longer than technology. Uh, it, it, you know, people were drawing on caves before they had even invented a written language, right? Yes. And so I have to believe that that um, very, very uh, primitive and basic idea of human expression uh, is something that is hardwired into us as a species, regardless of whatever, whatever toys or tools we may create uh, in the process. Um, I just think that, that what has happened and the, the period that we're living in now is that technology has gotten ahead of everything else. It's moved so quickly that in a way it's almost preventing us. We, we've almost lost sight of what the goal was. We, we, we've become fixated on, on the distribution mechanism as opposed to the, the idea that we're trying to distribute. That, that, that's my impression. Whether that will change anytime soon, it's to be seen. Sometimes, you know, you need uh, earth-shattering events to kind of to kind of wake everybody back up and, and reground them. I think COVID, I think the pandemic has has done that to a degree, because it's changed the way the whole world uh, lives in terms of how it interacts with other people, in terms of how it works. And I think we're artistically, we, we still have uh, some time before we see the residual effect of that. And if there are more cataclys cataclysmic events like that, I think, I think you'll see art that will reflect it. So I think that in that respect, it's a mirror. Uh, in terms of the types of political narratives that you're alluding to, I think, Nico, part of the problem is that there are so many of them and it's such a vast array that nothing gets more than 20 seconds of attention, if you follow what I'm saying, because everybody is constantly bombarded with millions of messages that it's impossible to uh, digest and comprehend and really contemplate and, and, do, uh, and, and create uh, or foment an intelligent response. And I think, I think that's problematic. Again, I think it's the technology getting ahead of everything else. Look, now I'm a social critic, I apologize. <laughs> no, no, this is very interesting because it comes back to what we saw in the, in the stories of antiquity, the balance that, that you mentioned. You know, yeah. the sketches bring, bring this balance and this is a good reminder that we need to regain the equilibrium uh, again. This is very interesting. You know, Thank it's you funny. Very I mean, I mean, even even creating one of those drawings, somebody might say, "Well, this is so anachronistic. It took you two weeks to make this drawing. The world can change four times in two weeks." You know, so that that's almost to the point of what I'm trying to say. Even the process, even what I'm doing, uh, it, it, it might be so out of sync with with how the world is operating today. But we need, you know, we all need something to attach ourselves to to ground ourselves. We can't. Yeah. We can't be floating in space, you know? At least I you, can't. You brought that issue of timeless, of, 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 of standing there and, and rediscovering it. So I think this is a good message. And yeah. uh, our, uh, uh, the way we uh, connected uh, uh, your uh, artwork with the, the Greek War of Independence was exactly that. that uh, I think that was great, yeah. That the high moment uh, of, um, you know, of, what is to be Greek or what is to fight for? We have the testimony of the heroes, Macriani, Kolkontroni, and others, Diakos. And this is what we, we, we fought for. Uh, I mean, this is in their writings, right? So we see that this timeless thing, you need to grasp uh, these pieces of art to, to, to 
create identity, national identity. I, not, I, not I totally only, agree. Not only personal, but also national identity. Well, it's it funny is. because I was, I was looking at the exhibit again the other day, looking now in the context of my drawings with the quotes that you so uh, articulated and, and put in in such an elegant way. And it's funny because then you see kind of a, a synthesis and, and, and a crystallization of an idea. And I think that's when, that's when you begin to really resonate. When things become crystal clear mm -hmm. is, is when, when, when you reach that clarity is when you're now beginning to operate at, at a much higher level. And, and that's one of the things that I'm just lacking in what I see in the world around me. There's, there, it's, there's a lack of clarity, you know, and national mm -hmm. identity can be, can be thrown into that uh, context along with everything else. So yeah, it's a, it's a, we live in an interesting period for sure. Of course, of course, and uh, and art still is a great chance for human emancipation, and this is the message that we we can bring. It will be, uh, I think that maybe the next wave of art will be the uh, revolution against the machines. If that's not already a cliche, <laughs> we'll see. And and it, it can create great great music also. I guess. Yeah, you know, just don't, uh, you have to drive the machine. The point is not to let the machine drive you. I think that's, that's really the, the takeaway. Well, John, Yanni, Fotiadi, thank you very much for having this discussion <laughs> with me. I think, me I think we've exhausted each other. <laughs> and uh, the I clinic appreciate it. Board, thank you. At Queen's College. Uh, and, uh, uh, soon we'll have a chance to see your uh, new work and, uh, and hopefully to have uh, uh, a new exhibit. Well, Thank I was you very gonna much. say uh, one, one last thing. If anybody uh, watching this is interested and they are on Instagram, uh, I do have an art account on Instagram, Yanni dot, and that's Y-A-N-N-I dot Fotiadis, F-O-T-I-A-D-I-S art dot art art and you can go to instagram and you can see a whole archive uh, going all the way back to my architectural drawings early architectural drawings up to the the field sketches that i did in greece this past summer as well as uh, some of the things that i'm working on right now so it's all there and uh, and you can go and uh, and check it out and please yeah, we'll, follow me if you're if you're interested why not we'll put that link to there and also, I want to thank you publicly that uh, because you are very generous, you want to donate a couple of your sketches Absolutely. to the Clinic American to our Museum, to, to, you know, to our gallery. So we're going to have uh, your, and some I'm, of and your I'm work waiting, to that. I'm waiting for you to come with your committee to yeah. figure out what you like. I'll, I'll check the studio, of course. Please. Thank do. you very much, Yanni. Thank you, Nico. Thank you again. Thank you.